Welcome to the Ajvana Podcast, where we illuminate subjects in the IT infrastructure space. Get ready to hear some amazing insights from outstanding individuals that will change the way you think about IT. And now, here's your host, Mark Teeley. It's my pleasure to introduce the inaugural Edgevana podcast and our first guest, Peter Gross. Peter has a long and storied career in the data center world, leading some to call him the godfather of the modern data center. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you. I'm, uh, there are very few people in the business that uh, are as knowledgeable and smart as you are, and uh, it's always a privilege for me to talk to you. Uh, you're not supposed to give me all kinds of kudos, Peter. You're the guest here. Yeah, but you're Thank more you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. No, it's, it's, it's fantastic to have you. And as you said, it's always a pleasure chatting. And so this is almost like um, I feel almost guilty because uh, finding a half hour to chat with Peter is what I want to do, not just a podcast opportunity. So thank you very much. I appreciate you um, spending the time with me again. So, you know, we, we talked before the show about a few topics and, and I want to try to get through um, a, a minimal number of questions for two or three topics and, and give the audience something to chew on. And, and the first topic I want to talk on is, you know, the last 20 years of data center development, you know, entering the, this century, so around 2000, most data centers were designed very traditionally, raised floor, forced air cooling, very low power density, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of the first indicators for you um, in, in the last 20 years of serious change in the industry? Um, yeah, I, uh, I spent um, the past uh, 30 some years of my career in, uh, in this industry. So I've seen it all. It was a fasting, fasting journey. Um, the, uh, the early parts, uh, the uh, mid eighties towards uh, the end of the century were uh, what I would call the infancy of this, uh, of this uh, business. Uh, uh, it was all about reliability. The main customers were, um, were financial institution banks, some big telcos and some uh, government agencies. And uh, there was, uh, um, the, the reliability was essential. Um, there was, uh, uh, the industry was early, the equipment was not very reliable yet, uh, uh, the, the industry has not matured uh, uh, enough, but, um, but there was making progress. Uh, um, I, would, I would think there are three main events that reshape this industry in terms of uh, uh, design architecture uh, of uh, your, your typical data centers. One was around the turn of the century during the, uh, the initial phase of the dot-com. All of a sudden, uh, the whole profile of the industry has changed. We went from this uh, very deliberate, slow building, uh, uh, extremely expensive uh, uh, data centers towards this extraordinarily ag aggressive rush to, to build uh, new all over the world. Uh, so all of a sudden, uh, reliability, reliability always uh, uh, is a, a top priority, but now for the first time, speed to the market and to a lesser extent, cost became important. The second event was the financial cr uh, crisis of 2008, when uh, um, the, the industry and primarily the financial in uh, industry and some other big enterprises recognized the fact that they are spending way too much money on IT. Uh, uh, historically, IT was for many, many enterprises were the core of their business. Banks and financial institutions are essentially, essentially technology companies. And uh, uh, the, the, the CFOs, the CI, uh, CEOs didn't quite understand what IT does, but they knew very well that without Without IT, without data centers, there is no business. So, so uh, it's it's hard to say money was not no object, but uh, but the budgets for for IT uh, were uh, extraordinarily generous. Billions of dollars uh, uh, were were spent, and uh, and the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, all of a sudden, and that that came in conjunctions with the uh, with the development of. Um, uh, 
first collocation players, first uh, internet players, where they had other priority and uh, they were able to build the data centers, not for $25 million, but now for maybe $15 million or so even less than that. So, uh, so that uh, again, changed change the industry quite a bit. And the third one, the, the third uh, um, uh, event uh, is the, the rapid uh, event of, um, of the hyperscale industry, uh, the internet cloud uh, business, also, you know, search, uh, uh, social media, um, the, the, the kind of uh, autonomy this com company has uh, have, the fact that they have so many resources and uh, they are building such a um, grand scale in terms of size, in terms of power, in terms of uh, uh, volume, uh, have also uh, enable them to bring significant innovations that also create created this uh, uh, third uh, third stage of uh, advancement in the in the data center business. Uh, that's uh, that's amazing, and, I, and certainly I've seen a lot of that as well. And and um, uh, one one of these days we'll have to talk just about the sheer scale and how much we're adding on a on a yearly basis now versus what but, uh, we were adding twenty years ago. You know. Amazing. But an interesting observation, and I don't know if you agree with that, uh, but for me it was always uh, a bit troublesome. There is no real correlation uh, between the big, big uh, uh, transitional steps in the IT business, uh, whether we talk, you know, obviously a little bit of a transition from mainframe to distributed, but from that point on, where we went through distributed virtualization, uh, um, internet, uh, cloud, um, the, there was no real correlation in terms of uh, design, in terms of architecture, in, in terms of delivery. Uh, and in a way, um, the data centers of, uh, the, of today is not as different uh, to the data centers of the 90s. Uh, while the the profile of technology uh, today's today's um, um, internet data centers uh, um, and uh, uh, every every element uh, whether it's storage, whether it's network, whether it's uh, everything, uh, uh, every every platform is so fundamentally different than what we had in the 80s and 90s. Right, right. No, couldn't agree more. You know, and so staying on that and and sort of. Um, uh, dovetailing to that comment about uh, the correlation between the facility and, and the workload inside or the or the design of the infrastructure supporting the workloads inside um, there's been you know there'd been talk uh, of of density change and, and a demand for higher density as early as I mean I think you and I might have had our first conversation about this as as early as 2005 or 2006 um, and it took a while for density to start to um, really moving up beyond just some small incremental change year over year. What do you think was the catalyst for that? Well, uh, one has to look at, at the type of data center. So it's, I always felt that uh, uh, the, the generic name data center is, is not really right. Uh, uh, there is such a fundamental difference between an enterprise and the internet data center and the collocation in the uh, uh, HPC, uh, high performance computing or edge. Each one has very clear and unique attributes. Uh, so um, each individual, each individual type of data centers has uh, has a different trajectory when it comes to uh, density. So, you know, today, uh, you know, enterprise uh, has never uh, uh, placed a big importance on on a density. On uh, uh, sure, there are. There are clusters of uh, high density where the, the, you know, the, the, the bank or the financial institution does certain certain work, but the, the vast majority um, is not. And the uh, reality is that with the exception of some very critical applications, uh, most of the workloads have migrated to either cloud or to um, collocation. Um, so um, enterprise will not drive uh, um, higher density. Um, right. At the other extreme, you have uh, the cloud players, but their data centers are so are so standardized, so industrialized, uh, um, and they are fairly uh, well satisfied with uh, their 10 to 12, maybe 13 kilowatt per cabinet, uh, and uh, this is not gonna change. 
obviously, if you look at some of the, you know, the players, the Googles and the, uh, Microsoft, they also have clusters uh, uh, operating at high densities, uh, you know, uh, uh, HPC uh, and uh, AI work uh, that it's, uh, it's um, go at much higher densities. Uh, Colos, uh, you know, they are in a difficult position. They, they, they have, uh, with few exceptions, they don't have, uh, they, they don't have the visibility to, the, to uh, enable them to, to make decision about density because they don't know who the next tenant is going to be unless, uh, unless they, uh, they uh, uh, build a facility specifically for uh, one big hyperscale player. They don't know who's going to come. So they, uh, they, they need to have the flexibility to not enable to provide any kind of uh, density. And then uh, you have the AI, you have the NVIDIAs, you have um, HPC, which uh, uh, where the densities are really exploding. Um, um, where you have, uh, where you have uh, um, 20, 30, going to 50, going to 100 kilowatt per, per cabinet. And that's where you see a lot of uh, innovation, primarily in, uh, in cooling, uh, either immersed cooling, on surface cooling. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna we're gonna see what uh, what Edge is gonna bring to the table because Edge uh, uh, certain a certain percentage of the Edge data centers who's all uh, always uh, will, will always uh, be operating at very high densities. You, you're gonna have uh, uh, and you know Open 19 uh, is is actually well well suited for uh, for this uh, uh, higher density. So uh, Edge is gonna bring a, a different dimension to the to the, this whole issue. No, I agree with that. I, I agree with that significantly. Um, so as much as I could spend uh, the next uh, 15 minutes of our short half hour talking just about data center and data center technology, I want to shift a little bit and talk about um, the buying behavior in the data center space. And um, I'm, I'm focusing on kind of two things here. One is sort of the enterprise side of, you know, what are they looking for when they're going out and searching for new data center capacity uh, in the market? And and then, um, you know, for the for the data center offering for the Colo company um, in in um, agreement or in partnership with uh, with their enterprise buyers, a question maybe about how um, best for them to grow their business, right? So let's 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 start first with uh, you know the question about the consumer. And it, it seems to me that, um, and it seems that this has really changed just in the last five years, Peter. But I'd love your perspective. Is that the buyer seems to be um, looking for uh, uh, global partners and they seem to be looking for um, partners that can get them almost anywhere in the world that they need to go, even if they don't need to go there right now. And, and, and the reason I think that's a change, and this is where I want to get your feedback, is that I believe, you know, based on my own personal experience from anything more than five years ago, that the vast majority of requests for buying data center capacity or procuring data center capacity were almost always a one-to-one -one relationship. I have a data center here in Santa Clara, California. I don't have enough room in it anymore and I need your colo to make some uh, additional room or I wanna get out of my data center in Fremont, California and I wanna be, just put it in your colocation facility in Fremont, California. And that I feel like that business model or that procurement model is changing. What, what do you see in that? Part of the market. Yeah, yeah you're you're absolutely right. That this it, it's it is it is changing, and uh, um, everybody wants to be everywhere. I mean, that's that's the the theme I see uh, more and more. Uh, um, this is a global business, um, and the ability to provide uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a, a great deal of uh, space, a great deal of capacity. But ability to to be in various parts of the country, uh, going beyond the the tier one, tier two uh, cities, but also uh, be able to go various parts of South America or Asia. I think it's becoming more and more important. Uh, and uh, these companies are are looking for someone that has this kind of global footprint. It's very difficult to to a deal like this. It's uh, even for a small for a small capacity. It's never easy. Uh, it's very, it's, uh, the process is long and difficult and uh, uh, there are corporate uh, uh, limitation uh, uh, requirements and uh, there are uh, um, a lot of regulation having to do with uh, the, the, the country and the, the policy there. So, um, 
So the ability to uh, be able to contract uh, with, uh, with providers in other parts of the world is becoming more and more difficult. Obviously, they are looking for other, other things, uh, you know, tax, issue, tax, taxation is important, uh, energy efficiency is important, um, carbon and sustainability is important, um, you know, and obviously uh, cost, cost is also uh, an important factor. Uh, but uh, but uh, all in all, um, that's one of the reason uh, the big uh, the big five uh, REITs and a few others have been so successful because they have a global footprint and uh, a lot of companies, even if they don't need, don't have a need for tomorrow, they uh, they they want to be associated with someone that has the ability to provide them uh, the support they need in various parts of the world uh, next year or five years on their own. Right, right. No, that's, that's exactly what I'm seeing too. And, and so I appreciate that feedback and, and totally agree uh, for a lot of obvious reasons. So sort of a, a core of that, um, you know, more than five years ago, certainly if you go back seven to 10 years, um, uh, it was a successful business model by and large to have a data center that was run probably better than most enterprise data centers, when I'm speaking about a co-location business, to have a data center, maybe three data centers in a small region um, or even across a continent. And, um, and most of your business was one-to-one -one opportunities. You know, Disney needs uh, some redundancy or um, somebody wants to put their DR site or somebody just wants of their data center and move it into a colo and not worry about owning a data center. But it was a very much relationship and, and, and the buyer wasn't looking for anything, uh, they weren't sophisticated enough maybe, or, or weren't seeing the future enough, or weren't worried about the future enough to look for anything more than just alternative to what they had been doing in their enterprise data center. So when you consider the, the, this new model of, um, of what a data center was versus what a data center should day from an, enter, from an enterprise support standpoint, what do you see as some of the key characteristics of a modern co-location company um, being, you know, more successful in representing themselves to the enterprise? Um, I mean, there are a, a number of uh, uh, elements here that need to be considered. Uh, a lot of these data centers have no visibility in the world. Uh, they are, uh, they are uh, fairly parochial, uh, could be good quality, uh, uh, good, uh, good design, good equipment, uh, uh, but uh, but the fact that they are uh, uh, a single unit without any any uh, presence uh, um, in uh, other parts of the country would, would always be a, a, a handicap. Also, the fact that, that they they don't have the resources, the capabilities, the uh, uh, the financial support to provide a slew of services that uh, a lot of this this company expects. Uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about what the, you know, an Equinix and other big players have done in terms of Cross Connect and Cloud Connect or uh, Bare Metal. I mean, they're all kind, of, but there are all other, uh, uh, a lot of other things that, uh, that uh, these, these companies lack. So whether it's uh, legal support, uh, whether uh, uh, they don't have the, the, the marketing uh, uh, resources to, to really promote themselves and become more, more visible. So, uh, so a successful business like this have to have, uh, it's, it's not enough anymore to, to just, ha just have uh, power and cooling uh, uh, at a certain location. The business is becoming quite competitive. There are uh, a fairly large number of players. Uh, it's obvious that, that the margins are shrinking. Uh, um, you know, a few years back, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, fairly common to get uh, 180 and maybe 150 dollars per kilowatt per, uh, per month. Now, now the numbers are below 100 uh, uh, in m many regions uh, uh, in the country and, and overseas. So, so, P uh, so these, these companies are struggling. So they need, they need uh, uh, to find ways to uh, enhance their, their capabilities, enhance their, uh, their, uh, uh, presence, uh, 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 ability to, to become more, more, uh, more visible. Right, right. Would you say that they, that there's a, a complexity factor for the modern data center provider, especially when you think of um, the fact that, you know, whether you have a five megawatt data center or a 50 minute center, 
you largely need the same, right? Uh, you might need a few more security guards or a few more option types or, uh, you know, more, one or two more electricians or HVAC support uh, or engineers. But generically speaking, whether it's five or 50, you need the same support. But what's missing in, in the scale is that ability to build um, some of the unique services that you talked about. And it seems like, um, you know, whether that unique service is a, is a localized managed service or whether it's cloud uh, capabilities or whatever, it seems like that's a real gap, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, to totally agree. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, unless these this, uh, uh, this players um, uh, really upgrade their, uh, their offerings, uh, um, the, uh, they're going to die. I mean, it's just uh, uh, if you look at uh, how aggressively this business is consolidating, uh, uh, if you see uh, that the, 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 the big players are, uh, are uh, acquiring uh, a lot of the, the middle level uh, players, uh, and uh, they have the capability to provide all these services. If these, this, if the rest of the the, the, the pack, if the rest of the of the uh, uh, population of data centers don't uh, don't uh, uh, find ways to uh, to improve their their offerings, they're gonna they're gonna be in trouble. Right. No, I, I, I get the same um, perspective. Uh, uh, I feel the same. So, uh, Peter, we're close to the end of uh, half an hour, and I can't believe it's gone by so fast already. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to just get in uh, two more questions. And, and the question I want to ask you um, is, you know, you, you and, and this is a really off topic from the rest of the questions, but I, I feel like it's so important. And you know that how I feel about it, um, and you're obviously passionate about it. Tell me a little bit, you know, the pandemic seems to have heightened the world's attention relative to the environment and climate. Uh, and you've spoken many times, you and I have spoken many times about net zero carbon for data centers. Tell us a little bit about what that means. Well, actually it's, uh, it's the three zeros, uh, right? Uh, carbon emission and, uh, and waste. Um, and uh, it's, it's absolutely remarkable how serious a lot of these, uh, these players you know, data centers uh, are not the largest consumer of electricity in the world. There are other uh, industries, other segments of the industry that uh, consume more. But for whatever reason, data centers are the most visible uh, users of, uh, of uh, energy. And because of that, and because of the, the, the role they play, uh, whether it's uh, social media, whether it's a uh, uh, consumer, whether it's uh, 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 search, whatever it is, uh, they, they have taken this, uh, uh, this initiative to reduce the carbon uh, very seriously. And uh, um, you, you see some remarkable work, uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, historically, the players have, uh, have, uh, have used their resources uh, to, uh, to buy uh, renewable energy uh, racks, uh, renewable energy credits. That, that was the main, uh, the most important, it continues to be uh, the, the single most uh, 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 significant way uh, for, uh, for these companies to, uh, uh, to reduce their, their carbon footprint. But the reality is that um, if you, uh, if you uh, buy wind power in uh, Iowa and uh, use electricity uh, coal generated in, um, I don't know, in Carolina, it's not exactly the same thing. It's still, so, so right now, right now it's a clear trend toward finding ways to, um, to become uh, a zero carbon provider uh, specifically for data centers. And you start seeing uh, um, the, the first, uh, the, the first uh, um, projects that uh, are focusing on this, uh, you know, the, uh, the Google project in Nevada where the, uh, uh, they are building a big uh, uh, solar, solar array in the vicinity of a uh, new data center in Henderson and uh, they're building this enormous uh, uh, storage uh, lithium ion plant uh, next to it. Uh, but the economics are, are very tough there. Uh, then you have this uh, big hydrogen project in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, it's still in the, in the uh, very early stage for, for capital that uh, announced that they are building uh, a hydrogen uh, uh, driven uh, uh, power plant uh, and that uh, it's a tri-gen, uh, it's gonna be energy cooling and heat uh, uh, for, for uh, that, 
data centers still in, uh, in conjunction with Mitsubishi. That's, um, that's another very interesting project. It's, it's not easy to do, as I said. Uh, most of the companies today focus on either energy efficiency, low PUE, which obviously has a factor, but it doesn't uh, eliminate the carbon, or some sort of on-site generations. And um, when it comes to fuel cells, maybe uh, you know, the, the gas-driven engines, uh, uh, gas-driven reciprocating engines to replace diesel generators, it's, a, it's another element that contributes to this, uh, this global effort. Uh, overall, um, um, I, th I think that uh, we are still a couple of years away from uh, having some, some really meaningful zero carbon solution for data centers, but uh, the signs are there, whether it's going to be a different type of uh, on-site um, energy storage, uh, it could be some new batteries, not lithium ion, uh, I mean, lithium ion doesn't, economics don't work, but there are other type of uh, batteries, uh, flow batteries or uh, liquid metal batteries. Uh, uh, this uh, some sort of uh, compressed air or pump, pump hydro, maybe not all that uh, well suited, but uh, I, I'm encouraged by what I see about uh, hydrogen. Uh, I'm encouraged by uh, uh, a, a very interesting solution, at least uh, in my opinion, is uh, liquid air. That uh, in terms of economics, in terms of reliability, in terms of uh, um, maturity of the of the uh, of the the product and the uh, the solution. Uh, will make it very well su suitable for uh, for data center applications. Awesome. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great it's a great uh, uh, great place to uh, to uh, to come up with uh, some innovation and uh, yeah no I, I agree I mean it, it's, it really it's, needs it. yeah we definitely need it and it's uh, it is fascinating and, and it's um it's frankly it's hard to keep up with uh, as a, a side interest of mine it's hard to keep up with all the stories about new batteries and new power generation capabilities and, and efficiencies in the data center right. itself. Um, so Peter, uh, we're, we're about to wrap up and I want to ask you one more uh, slightly self-serving question. Um, you know, you've had a long, um, a very successful career in the IT and, and data center space. Um, and uh, um, Edgevana is just this little puppy um, that's trying to make a difference in the industry. What made you decide to, um, to join the board at Edgevana and help us out? Well, um, this is that uh, uh, it's uh, technology, this, this whole uh, um, data center industry has been my passion for, for so many years. And uh, now I'm involved with a, a, a bunch of different technology companies. But, but, but I think that of all of them, Edgevana is probably the most interesting uh, and the most promising. I think that uh, it fills a, a need and uh, I, I, I cannot emphasize how impressed I'm, I'm by, by your, your vision and your idea of, uh, of starting a company like this, because this is what this industry needs. And we talked a little bit about that, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the ability to build a, a platform that uh, will bring a lot of uh, small or medium-sized players uh, and uh, enable them to provide the service that it's, it's needed, uh, uh, clearly, clearly needed by the industry. Um, I mean, I'm surprised that uh, nobody else came with this, <laughs> this idea earlier, but, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm extremely excited about this. I think that it has, this uh, Edvana has a, a very, very bright future. <laughs> so um, so um, uh, it didn't take uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of work for you to convince me to join the board. <laughs> I'm honored to be on this and uh, very, very excited about it. Well, I appreciate that, Peter, and feelings mutual. I'm, I'm honored to have you and uh, obviously enjoy working with you and speaking with you all the time. Um, so with that, folks, I'd like to thank Peter for joining me on this inaugural edition of the Edgevana podcast. Uh, you can look forward to future podcasts probably on a biweekly basis. And um, again, Peter, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward for, uh, to, to listen to the next podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Edgevana Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening app or on YouTube. To learn more, visit www.edgevana.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us on our next episode.